It's great to have you all here this morning. And um, if you've not been to church before, then there are elements to church that are, might seem strange. One of those would be this communion table. And our instruction from the Bible is, if you, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you can say that you've accepted Jesus as your saviour, then it doesn't matter where you're from, you're welcome to join with us in this symbolic act. And that's what this is, it's a symbolic act. It's an act where we remember that Jesus died for us so that we could have forgiveness from God. And so there's nothing in the emblems, nothing at all, there's nothing in the emblems, they are symbols. But these symbols speak to us of the body of Jesus Christ that died on a cross and the blood that was shed, which is what God says is the price for his forgiveness. And so this morning, we're going to break bread together. It's a part of our church service. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, then it's not an issue. Just let the emblems pass by because there's a tremendous charge on this table. The Bible says, if anybody eats or drinks of these emblems in an unworthy manner, they will be found guilty. And so, as the emblems come by, don't worry if you haven't made a commitment. If you don't know Jesus, then just let the emblems pass. But if you do know Jesus, then I encourage you to join with us this morning because it's what believers do. So I'm asking Paul and Elaine and Jackie if they'll come, please. So as the emblems come round, it might seem a little different to you. There's, there's bread and wine. Just take one cup of each and then we'll share together at the same time. So just let the emblems come round. And as the emblems are coming round this morning, there's just one little verse that I was thinking of. I was wondering whether our preacher would arrive this morning. It's a little bit later than normal. And so I began to scramble through my Bible thinking, what am I going to say if the speaker doesn't turn up? But of course, God had a better plan because there's a better preacher this morning and he'll be coming just after me. But um, this morning I read from the book of John, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And as the emblems come round, it was just this simple thought. I speak to so many people who tell me all about how God says they cannot do this and they cannot do that. I speak to so many people who tell me how God is a God of condemnation. But actually, what these emblems say is that God is a God of forgiveness. What these emblems say is God did it for us when we couldn't do it for ourselves. God made a way for us to have a friendship and a peace with Him. And that's what this table is all about. And so this morning, we're going to break bread together. So the verses in the Bible say, I have received from the Lord this that I also share with you. That Jesus, on the very same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. And so we break the bread together to remember Jesus. same way after supper he took a cup full of wine and he said this cup this is the new covenant 
what he meant was this isn't a new arrangement between heaven and earth. This is the commitment that God is making to human beings. This is the new arrangement in my blood. That through my blood, men might know and have peace with me. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of him. Because as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, I'm going to invite our speaker to come. He's going to share a thought from the Bible for us. If you need facilities, there's soft play in the next room with video link. So the little ones can go and play if they want. And if you need changing facilities or anything else, just to this side, you'll find everything for parents and young ones. Thanks, Phil. Well, it's lovely to see everyone. Is this on now? Good. Without the power, we won't go nowhere, will we? <laughs> I can't take my eyes off Ian. <laughs> He's wearing a jacket. I asked him out there, why is he wearing a jacket for? I didn't know this was all about. This came upon me once before with Arthur's great-grandson. Great-great-grandson. Lovely, though. Lovely to see it full. Because this morning, they had, over in Brimar, or down in Nanty Grove, they had to close a, a place of worship because of COVID. They closed it. And it's not a great big church. But look at us. We are full. Looks good. Now then, anybody here from England? Me. I knew, I knew, I knew you was because uh, <laughs> if there's anyone, any of you from Merthyr? Aberdeen, are you? No? Aberdeen, near enough, Merthyr. <laughs> the nicer. No. This isn't planned. This, uh, this I have just thought of, right? I have always said it, the friendliest people in the world from Merthyr. I've always said it, and I believe it. I find them the friendliest, or oh, Aberdeen, or oh, that area, friendly as can be. Oh, they've got the rough ones just like we have. No, you know, but they are the friendliest people in the world. I find them awful friendly. I've never been over there. We go over there shopping a lot. Went there for years to church. Never found that. No, never. No offense from anybody. And when I was working, a lorry driver came. He had to make a delivery to a factory in Merthyr. And he was very nervous because this factory he went, there was a bloke there who must have been a bit of a tyrant. And he said to me, he said, I've been told about a place in Merthyr. He said, do you know it? No, I said, I don't know it. Because he said to this, this man, I said, you'll be all right. Don't worry about it. I said, I'll tell you something now. They're the friendliest people, and I, and I use these words, friendliest people on God's earth. But there again, we say something on the spur of the moment, but sometimes they make you think, should I have said it? But I just said it out because I believed it. The friendliest people on God's earth, they are so friendly, they got their hand in your pocket while they're talking to you. <laughs> Afterwards, I thought, hang on now, but lovely, and English, English. Well, thank God he got a Welsh flag. <laughs> and what's, what was the other one? Black one, oh. Right. Yeah, I've always felt sorry for Ian, <laughs> and I don't want to be personal. I always have, because you can see by him through and through, he's an Englishman, isn't he? Yeah. Englishman. But he lived in Wales for so long, I've come to the conclusion that he'd love to be a Welshman. <laughs> because you won't beat us Welsh people, I don't care where you go. <laughs> and I had a feeling for to pray for him. I prayed for him for a long time. Because he isn't Welsh now, and he isn't English. You know where he's stuck now, don't you? He's stuck in the land of Wenglish. <laughs> He'll never be one or the other again, never again. I'd like to just pass on a few thoughts. I've had to alter a little bit. Never mind, he'll come out all right. 
when Moses, I, first of all, I want to take a walk. And I want to cover a period in the Bible, just a walk, stroll, and we'll stop and talk to one or two people along the way. Overall, the walk would have took, it covered a period of over 3,000 years. Right? We'll do it in half hour. Right? <coughs> and so, I want to start in the scriptures in Exodus and just go through the scriptures and we'll meet these people and just talk to them for a few minutes just to show how God works, what our God is like. Now, there's great stories in the Bible. Some of them we learned in Sunday school, some we have heard, and some we'll never forget. God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, captivity. And God went and chose Moses out in the desert when he was looking after the sheep. He'd been out there in the desert working away for 40 years. And then God visited him and spoke to him through a burning bush. Now, it was something extraordinary that Moses had to go and see what it was. And when he saw what it was, he never forgot it. And God spoke to him and took him, we know, down into Egypt. And he was there for about 10 months. And he went through all of the plagues in the Bible, the Old, the Old Testament, plagues. Through the plagues, and we know all about them, God was demonstrating his power to his people. And Moses led the children of Israel across the Red Sea. Can you imagine standing on the banks of a, red, of a sea? And all of a sudden, the water begins to, to part. And he said that the, that the water he, in the scriptures, it went up in heaps, in walls. Can you imagine that? We are here now in this meeting, and outside we have a terrible thunderstorm, and the rain comes down like I don't know what. Like the eight stones yesterday afternoon. And it comes down so bad that the car park is flooded, and it's going halfway up the church. And it's creeping up and up, and we are here in the meeting. All right? And then suddenly the meeting finishes and we go to go out and we can't because it's up to the rooftop. Right? So somebody outside shouts in, don't worry, you'll be all right. We'll call the council. And we'll get the council to come and put up some shutter in from the door out past the car park where the water is very low and we'll get it out safely. So we are in here for a good while while they put up this shutter in. And then they say, right, it's all right, come on out. Now I know who's going to be the first one to go out. Pastor. It won't be me, that's for sure. <laughs> to go out to walk between these two great big walls of water. They give away, flood, we're all drowned. And that's what they were facing. They were looking at a pathway straight through the Red Sea. And God, we know, took them through. And they landed on the other side safe and sound. They stood there for a while afterwards. Now, when God does something, he does it. They stood there for a while watching the water coming together again as if nothing had happened. But they stood there for a while watching the chariots that had been chasing them. They all sink into the bottom of the, of the sea. And then when they had moved away, still couldn't take in, couldn't understand what was happening, did it really happen? And they began to celebrate. And there was Miriam, Moses' sister, playing the tambourines, and they was having a good old dance, good old sing, laughing, enjoying themselves. And then Moses stood up, must have been on like a little mountain, a little mound, higher than the people, we're talking about now that you've got a congregation of about nearly three million people. And he begins talking to the people. And he says this is a verse of scripture from Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. And, he look, and he's looking to God because this is and still is today the most miraculous act that God have ever performed <clears throat> in the Old Testament. 
and he looks up to God and he says, O is like unto thee. Amongst the gods, O is like thee. Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders, who is like thee? Now Moses knows what he's talking about. Who is like thee amongst the gods? And their gods we know was idols. They were idol worshippers. Their gods was Ashtaroth, Molech, Rempham, and you can name them and name them. Now I ain't going to go too far on this. I would normally, but not this morning. And if you want to worship an idol, in one religion you can choose any one out of 300,000. That's today. This is in Bible days. And when you look at it, I can tell you now, we are in Bible days. These idols are still around. And I won't go no deeper than that. Always like unto thee. Now in Merthyr, a couple of weeks ago, shopping in the uh, shopping centre, I'm walking along and there was a man there with a yellow bucket collecting for Ukraine. What do you like to get? Certainly. Put something back. Oh, he said, being as you put something in the bucket, he says, he said, I got a little, uh, little free gift for you. I said, oh, yes. So I had walked now about this distance apart. I says, all right. No, I don't. Yeah, yes, he said. So he went to the bag and pulled out a, it was a booklet. Now, see how deceiving things can be. A booklet. I said, no, I said, it's like, yeah, he said, have it. <coughs> and how it could have turned out, he pulled it out, as he pulled it out of the bag, the picture on the front was facing me. And for some reason, it was on a kind of a card, it was a little booklet, but it was a card booklet. And he was holding it like that. And I could see the picture, and it was a beautiful picture. Lovely colours, brilliant red, orange. <coughs> Brilliant. And I was standing this distance apart. And I said straight away, that's Ashtaroth. That's idol worshipping. That's an idol. I don't do idol worshipping. No, he said, it's all right. You have it. <coughs> Excuse me. You have it, he said. Could read it. No, I said, no, thank you. I don't want it. And I walked away. So we are still in Bible days. And that's not far from here. And God is... Moses is comparing God now to these idols. So they are celebrating. And when they had finished, they moved on and they began to walk through the wilderness. Now then, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's what it says. And it says, and he leadeth us or leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Now we're going to take a walk on a pathway of righteousness. Not only for a short time. You go, we go through the scriptures, Exodus, then you've got Leviticus, then you've got Numbers, and then you've got Deuteronomy. Moses has come to the end of his days and he's come now to the River Jordan. So there's something else to cross now. But Moses' days was numbered. God took him away to him. Now God has always got his man. Now then, that's what we say. God has got his man. And he's always referred to the man. He's always the man. Always. Not very much the woman. God has got his man. Well, for us, this morning we are privileged to be here because God doesn't call us man and woman. He calls us my servant and my armed maiden. There's a lovely ring to it. It's a, it's a lovely feeling. My servant. We belong to God. My armed maiden. You belong to me. You are mine. Lovely. A lovely greeting. Man has, God has always got his man. In every situation and in every place. And in every decade, as we would say, and in every 
hundreds of years and thousands of years. Always God is man, because God's plan has gone on before. It's not made up as we go along. We are walking the path of righteousness. And so you've got a man there waiting, Joshua, the great Joshua, mighty man of valor, Joshua. And God had chosen Joshua as his success, as Moses' successor. Now Joshua gathered all the people. Now Joshua and Caleb, they were two men who were chosen as spies and sent out for to spy out the land, whether for to go straight in and take the land or not. Two came back, which was Joshua and Caleb, and they said, yes, we could take it. It'd be hard going, but we can do it. And the other ten said no, and they wanted to turn back. So now they are in the land of Canaan, and God has instructed Joshua to divide up the land between the 12 tribes of Israel. The, tw the 12 tribes, all ordained by God, and there's Joshua and there's Caleb. And so Caleb says to Joshua, Joshua, remember the day that we were called to go out as spies? Well, that day God made me a promise through Moses and he went and promised me the mountains because he said every part of the earth that your foot has trodden on is yours. That was God's promise to me. And he was there, Joshua, me and you together, so you know the promise. God keeps his promise. He said, and that was when I was 40 years of age. He said, today, I am now 85 years old. That was 45 years ago. I'm 85 years of age. So Joshua, I'm claiming the promise that God gave me. He made the promise and God keeps his promise. So I want to take Hebron, which is in the mountains. Now I wonder if they had a kind of conversation like this. But look, you're 85 years of age, man. You don't want to go up in the mountains fighting. Great man, great man of courage, one of the greatest. But you don't want to go up fighting, especially in the mountains. Huh? Well, you've got Shushan. What about the area of Shushan? Now, Shushan would have been something like Oxford, Oxfordshire, beautiful pastoral land. What about that, Joshua? Uh, Caleb? Or why don't you take Emmaus, where Jesus walked with the two disciples? And that would be like something like Erifordshire. Take it easy, 85 years of age, man. You don't want to go. No, he said. I'm claiming the promise. God promised me, and I'm claiming the promise. And I'm taking the promise. Hey, but listen, no man. Not only is it up in the mountains, there's giants, the Anakims. Now, these, the writers, the, the theologians tell us, could be anywhere from eight to ten foot tall. Big giants. He said, they live up there as well. At your age. Yes. And so Caleb went and claimed the promise. But he had the secret, and the secret was this. If God goes with me, I'll take the land. That was the secret. And it doesn't matter how old we are. And if God at some time has made a promise to you, claim it. Because God will keep his promise. It might have been yesterday. It might have been years ago. Years ago, claim the promise. Now is the time to claim the promise. It's yours. Caleb went and he took the land. God has his man. His man. So we move on. And now we move now from Deuteronomy. We're into Joshua. We go from Joshua 
and we'll go into Judges. Now, all the time that we've been walking on the pathway of righteousness, the idol worshiping have been walking the pathway, the broad pathway, the pathway of sin. They've been walking that pathway. And it had been getting stronger and stronger and stronger. <coughs> and in Judges is a book where it had got to the point that it was coming to the point whether that God was, God Jehovah was the God of Israel or Baal. And so we meet another man of courage, which God used, a man by the name of Barak. And he called Barak. Now, he was a great man of courage. God had delivered the children of Israel into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan because of their wickedness. They was turning away from God. And he went and delivered them into the hand. And he used, he went and used, uh, sorry, he went and used judges. He went and used Barak. I'm moving it around in my head there. That's what it is. Right? He went and used Barak. Great man of courage. And he spoke to the prophet. Sorry. He spoke to the, pro to the prophet S. Deborah. And he said to, to Deborah, you go and tell Barak, call Barak and tell Barak for to take 10,000 men. You take 10,000 men and you go out to Mount Tabor and I will bring Jabin's army to you. Now the leader of the army was another great man of courage by the name of Sisera. And so, Barak, he thought, well, although he's a great man of courage, he thought, if I take Deborah with me, God wouldn't let nothing happen to her. So, he went to Deborah, and he said, will you come with me to the battlefront? And without any hesitation, she went and said, yes. Now, God has got his man of courage. And he also got his arm maiden. Every one of us are in our place. And out he went, and he had the victory. God had guaranteed him the victory. Now, Caesarea, the leader of the army, had escaped, and, and he had run away, and he'd been running all day, getting away from the soldiers. And he was running along the road, and who should be just up the road, there was a woman living in a tent by the name of J.L. And she saw him come in. And he asked her, could he have a drink? Yes, have a drink. Yes, by all means. And have a rest up as well. So she invited him for to sleep in the tent. You carry on and sleep there. I'll watch for you. She had recognized who it was. Who he was. And while he was sleeping, the tent pegs in those days not like ours, they were great big steel pins. She went and got one of his steel pins and an armor, and while he was sleeping, she went and drove it straight through his head and pinned him to the ground. You see, Barak had great courage, but because you've got great courage doesn't mean to say that you've got great faith. Not at all. God had to turn to his handmaiden, you women, for the faith. She had the faith. Surely I'll go with you. No hesitation at all, whatsoever. So she had the blessing and the anointing of God. But it was J.L. J.L. who had the prize. Every one of us is in our place. Every one of us. Now then, we'll move on from Judges and we'll come to the book of Ruth and now finished by that in the book of Ruth. Now, we are just ordinary people. Whether we're from England or no matter wherever we're from, we are ordinary people. 
but we don't know what God has got. We don't know about tomorrow and what God has got. And it's a beautiful story. Any time you've got five minutes spare, oh, you, oh, you want a book for to read, get the Bible and read the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful story. Ruth was a young woman. When I married, her mother-in-law was Naomi. She went and married one of his sons, and they died. And so Naomi went back home from where she came from, and Ruth went with her. Now, just an ordinary young woman, and the job that she had was out in the fields gleaning. Gleaning means going around after they had, they had, they had uh, cutting down the wheat in the harvest time and picking up all what's left over. And that's what they had for to live on. So everyone went and done it. And that was her job. Just an ordinary woman. But yet, only an ordinary woman to us. We're all here this morning, just ordinary people. But who knows? In the sight of God, we could be anything. There was a, this little boy being dedicated this morning. Alfie? Who knows? In the future, because God had his hand on Ruth, it's a beautiful story to read. He had his hand on Ruth. You would never have thought it. But Ruth was to become the great, great grandmother of the greatest king this world has ever known, King David, just an ordinary young woman. Now, who knows what God has got for us for in the future? I'm coming to the end now, and I'm watching the clock. But we never know. Now, God might have something great. Now, I have always had in my mind for years, this car park, and I believe it's going to happen, for years, that I'm going to pull into a meeting in the car, park it out there. Cars don't bother me. Old car, new car. I nev never bought the new car when I could have. I didn't. I went and bought it when they lost the, when the price dropped. I went I bought that tell. It doesn't bother me at all. But they'll be pulling in that car park in the car. And while we are by here now, there's going to be havoc out there. There's going to be a young man with a big piece of wood smashing every window in the car. And we're all going to go out for to see what's going on. And I'm going to stop anybody talking to the boy. Because that young man will be a great minister for God. I honestly believe that will happen. So we never know what God has got for us, and we don't know what God is going to do for little Alfie. Look at Winston Churchill. When he was playing with his friend, he was playing away, and his friend said to him, what are you going to be when you grow up? And he said, without any hesitation, I'm going to be a great man. And he was only about 10 or 12 years old. No pride or nothing in it. He said, I said it because I believed it. And that's exactly how it turned out. So we never know. God hasn't finished with none of us yet, no matter if we're 85 or whatever age we are. He hasn't finished. God has still got something for you. He's got something for me. He's got something for every one of us. Now, that's just a pathway through some of the scriptures that's in the Bible. We've got a good God, a great God. And he's our best friend. Now, Ruth was a great, great grandmother of the greatest king this world ever knew until Jesus came to Calvary. And he came because he was the king of all kings. So we have a good friend and a good saviour and like I said, 
who knows about tomorrow. Amen.